If you're looking to build a budget server or workstation with lots of cores, you'll be hard pressed to find something that's a better value than used Xeons. Older Ivy Bridge Xeon CPUs can be picked up for pennies on the dollar, and can have surprisingly high core counts, although that comes at the cost of high power draw and outdated specs. In 2023, is something like this even a good idea? Well, I'm going to use this to build somewhat of a budget system that's also kind of a cool sleeper system in my opinion, to see how well it performs not only as a hypervisor for running virtual machines, but also as a budget workstation. Let's get started. Now, buying a used Xeon may or may not be a good decision, but what's definitely a good decision is checking out the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is a learning community filled with curious and creative people, and it's a great place to go if you want to learn how to start a new career, take on a new hobby, or just find ways to be more productive. Now, I've talked in the past about Skillshare and how I've used courses to help me as a content creator, but sometimes I find Skillshare is great for simple, practical things. For example, AutoHotKey. AutoHotKey is some software I've used to be more productive, but it's been a while since I've programmed anything in it. So I decided to brush up on my skills by going through Farouk Fayaz's course, which helped me knock the rest off and get back up to speed. And now I've been using AutoHotKey a lot to speed up everything from video editing to just returning emails faster. If you're looking for ways to be more productive or just learn more skills, definitely check out Skillshare. And right now, if you're one of the first 500 people to click the link in the description, you'll get one month of Skillshare for free. So go join and start learning with Skillshare today. I've been running this YouTube channel for well over a year and a half now, and somehow this is the first time I've made a video covering used Xeons. Well, at least the E5 series, the bigger ones. And that's a bit odd, because for a while, X79 systems were the thing to get for budget systems. However, as these get older, newer CPUs get more efficient, and power costs keep rising for lots of people, the appeal seems to be slowly diminishing. So why did I even decide to make a video covering X79 motherboards and used Xeons? Well, because as I often do, I made a stupid purchase. One day while browsing Facebook Marketplace, I came across a listing for a used Dell motherboard, uh, Intel Xeon, and 32 gigabytes of DDR3 for just $20. <laughs> I started getting video ideas in my head and just didn't put all the pieces together, so I showed up and bought it, and when I showed up, the seller actually asked me if I wanted a second motherboard for just $10 more. So for 30 bucks, two X79 motherboards, a single CPU, and 32 gigabytes of DDR3. So without putting too much thought in it, I went out and bought two of these E5 2695V2 Xeon processors to do sort of a, hey, look, I bought two servers for like 50 bucks and it was gonna be a cool video, but yeah, that's not how it turned out. You see, I already had a feeling this was going to be difficult to work with, with it being a proprietary Dell motherboard, but I didn't quite understand how complicated it was going to be with a lot of proprietary headers and power. And on top of that, I don't think this motherboard even works. And on top of that, these actually aren't even the same model of motherboard. This is actually an X99 system and requires DDR4. And yeah, this was sort of a mess. So I decided to toss that whole idea, but I did have two of these Xeons that I already ordered and was kind of in the mood to do something around an X79 system since it's something, like I said, I've never covered before. So I basically just decided to make a video about this CPU, the E52695 V2. This CPU has 12 cores and 24 threads and has a base clock of 2.2 gigahertz, but can turbo up to 3.4 gigahertz. It can run standard DDR3 UDIM memory, but can also support registered ECC in quad channel. Now this also does have 150 watt TDP, but we'll get to that. Originally, this CPU would have cost well over $2,000, but today it could be picked up for way cheaper. I bought my two for $28 on eBay, but you can typically find them for around 15 bucks or so. To make this video happen, I started looking around for some cheap motherboards, but used X79 motherboards are still surprisingly expensive. So I ended up stumbling over to AliExpress and checking out some of the X79 motherboards they have there. I came across this motherboard from Jingsha? I'm pretty sure I'm butchering that, but oh well. And it cost around $40 or $45 with tax. Now there are some cheaper options, but this one did have an NVMe slot. 
However, it only has two PCIe slots, one of which is only by four, but that shouldn't be that big of an issue. Now, this also only has four DIMM slots and is limited to dual channel, but trying to find something with more slots and quad channel was getting pretty expensive, so I decided to just rein in the budget and go with it. It does include four SATA ports, and it's nice and compact. It's not quite a mini ITX board, but it's not a full-size micro ATX board either. Now, I did have memory from the Facebook Marketplace deal, but these are only 4GB DIMMs, which would leave me with just 16GB. So instead, I opted to buy a 32GB kit from eBay for 40 bucks. But 32GB might still prove to be not enough, but we'll get to that. While I was shopping on AliExpress, I also realized I didn't have a CPU cooler, so I bought this pretty cheap one for right around 20 bucks. With the main system pretty much put together, I decided to go ahead and just make sure it posted, but since the Xeon doesn't have an eGPU, I tossed in this NVIDIA K1200 I had on hand, but I couldn't get it to post. I tried pretty much everything you could think of, a different GPU, different memory, different memory in different slots, and eventually realized it came down to me just needing to power cycle my capture card, because it had been posting the entire time, I just didn't realize it. It posted, I have the motherboard, RAM, CPU, all working, but I needed to figure everything else out, starting with the case. Now, because the motherboard was so compact, I had the thought to see if there was something out in my garage that I could maybe repurpose and put this in. And that led me to this. This is the Compact CQ 5720F. And it's actually a really special computer for me. Not only was this the computer I covered in my very first video, but it's also the computer that made the fan sound that you hear in all of my intros. So if there was any system I had on hand that deserved to be refeatured in a video, I figured this one made the most sense. Also, other than the stupid Torx slash flathead screws and the fact that it's upside down compared to most layouts, this case is actually just a bog standard MATX case. Ah, <sighs> good times when computer manufacturers just used standard ATX hardware. First, I started by just completely gutting everything. Before dropping in the motherboard, it needed a boot drive, so I used this 256GB SSD from Team Group that I've used in pretty much all my videos for the last couple months or so, and then dropped the motherboard in the case. And this is a quick reminder that you do get what you pay for when you buy cheap motherboards off of AliExpress, because I don't think the designers of the motherboard ever actually used it in a build themselves. If they had, they probably would have realized how terrible some of the screw placements are. This one here is literally blocked by the tabs of the DIMM slots, so it's pretty much impossible to get a screw in there. And it's even more of a pain in the butt when you accidentally plug in the wrong fan headers and have to take the motherboard back out and then put it back in again. I used this EVGA 650 watt bronze power supply because I happened to have it sitting around. And while that might not be the most efficient option, it'll give us plenty of power for anything we might want to do. Now to make this system a bit more fun, I dropped in this cage from Icy Dock. This lets you go from one five and a quarter inch bay to four two and a half inch bays. So that way I could drop in some SSDs later on. After plugging in all the cables, I also dropped in a two and a half gigabit NIC and the NVIDIA K1200 graphics card. And I do plan to remove the graphics card later on to try to bring the power draw down because I believe this system should be able to work entirely without a GPU, at least once we have something like Proxmox installed where we can access it via a web browser. Now, speaking of Proxmox, I thought it would be fun to use that IC dot cage to drop in four SSDs and set up a ZFS pool to run a bunch of virtual machines off of. But the only four SSDs that I had that were the same size were these 128 gigabyte SSDs from a video I did quite a while back. Now, 128 gigabytes is not a ton, but if I set these up in RAID 10, it'll at least give us some decently fast storage and we'll have about 250 gigabytes or so to work with. After a bit of off-camera cable management, things were looking pretty good. Looking good, but not sounding so good because the system fan sounded like a jet engine. Fortunately, I had some of these low noise adapters from Noctua lying around and was able to drop one in and that helped a lot. Although somehow I got the CPU fan on backwards, I got it all fixed eventually. With everything squared away and all the fans in the right direction, I installed Proxmox to try and take advantage of all those cores and 32 gigabytes of memory. Now we're a few minutes into this video and I know you've probably been wondering this entire time about power draw and I don't wanna make you wait too long. So while running Proxmox just sitting at idle, this system drew between 60 and 61 watts. 
But Proxmox isn't just going to be sitting idle, so I decided to start setting up some VMs and containers. I started off by setting up just one VM with Linux Mint, and then two containers, one running Casa OS and then Crafty to run some Minecraft servers, and then the other running Jellyfin. When running this, the power draw crept up to around 90 watts, but it was all working pretty well, minus the fact that memory was starting to get a bit cramped. I thought 32 gigabytes was going to be enough, but I didn't really think about the fact that I'd be using ZFS, and I think that was my problem here. ZFS likes to use pretty much any memory it can get its hands on, and maybe that wasn't the best idea. Regardless, everything ran really smooth. In the virtual machine I set up, I installed Linux Mint, and then set up Sunshine so that I could remote into it with Moonshine from my desktop. It was a pretty decent experience, and I even played some Super Tux Cart at a decent frame rate, although it didn't look the best. In a Debian container, I installed Casa OS so that I could quickly set up some containers, but really ended up just using this to run Crafty for some Minecraft servers. I ran both a paper server and a forge server, and both worked totally fine. Granted, it's a little hard to benchmark Minecraft servers by yourself. Regardless, when I hopped into either server, we were still barely utilizing the CPU. In a good way. Jellyfin ran great, and the system could even transcode 4K video without hardware acceleration, although power crept up to about 150 watts or so. Now, I could have used the GPU for some hardware accelerated transcoding, but my goal was to take that GPU out entirely, and that was actually what I tested next. Now, I was a bit nervous that there would be issues without a graphics card, because in the past, I've experienced network issues whenever you change PCIe devices, but everything worked fine, and this actually brought our power usage down by 15 watts. At idle, we were sitting at around 45 watts, and when running all of our servers, it was sitting at about 75 watts. Now, that's not nearly as bad as I expected. Granted, it's not great compared to some newer CPUs you can get, especially mobile chips, but with those options, you lose a lot of things like PCIe lanes, memory channels, or just your money. Now, with the big empty PCIe slot, I decided to drop in a quad 2.5 gigabit NIC, mostly just to see if I could break things, but I could still log into the Proxmox UI with no issues. I decided to tweak some memory usage settings and ran a few more VMs and containers, including PFSense using that quad NIC, as well as Home Assistant OS and Pi-hole, and it all worked like a charm. Now, high power draw is mostly just an issue if you're running something all the time, like a server, but what if you just need something like a workstation to run some software when you need to get some work done? Well, I decided to install Windows so that I could put this thing to the test doing what I do, editing videos. I should point out here that I couldn't install the most recent version of Adobe Premiere because of some limited instruction sets on the CPU, and that's something you should take note of if you're looking to run a 10-year-old CPU. Fortunately, I was able to install Premiere Pro 23, which just so happens to be the version I use, and I jumped into a recent project. With multiple 4K sequences, the system struggled a bit, especially when there were multiple effects running, but that was primarily a limitation of the GPU. With any GPU accelerated effects turned off, and while using proxies like I normally would, it handled the edit fairly well. Now, scrubbing and playback wasn't quite as smooth as my system running a 3950X, but it really wasn't that bad. To sort of test something other than Premiere Pro, I decided to run Cinebench. In Cinebench R15, the X79 system was pretty impressive, being only 10% slower than the Cottus Mine I just covered with its i7-1360P. However, the X79 system drew over three times the power. Things got even worse in the much newer Cinebench R23, where in the multi-threaded test, it was almost 24% slower than the Cottus Mind, and in the single-threaded test, it was 75% slower. Now, to be fair, there's a 10-year difference between those two CPUs, but even if you compare the Xeon to something like an i5-6500T, it's not great. In the multi-threaded test, it smashed the i5, but in the single-threaded test was 40% slower than an i5-6500T. This just goes to show the biggest weakness of these older Xeons, which is single-threaded performance. They're great if you're running software that can really take advantage of multiple cores and threads, or if you're trying to run a bunch of concurrent tasks like virtual machines and containers, but anything that needs single-threaded performance is going to really suffer. So maybe this makes sense, maybe it doesn't make sense, but that's all going to depend on the cost. So how much did I really spend on this whole project? Well, it gets a little tricky because a lot of these parts I already had on hand, but I'm going to sort of break it down sort of as best as I can. Well, obviously I bought two CPUs for around 30 bucks, but I think realistically we can say $15 for the CPU since you can find that right now on eBay. 
So with the CPU, RAM, and motherboard, I spent right around $100. If you tack on the cost of the cooler, power supply, and SSD, it's about $185. Now the case and the graphics card are a little bit trickier because the case I literally got for free because it was being thrown away and the graphics card I got with a system bundled together, but you can find these graphics cards are pretty similar for around $15 on eBay and the case, like I said, I got for free. So realistically for the whole system, about $200. Now if you add the two and a half gigabit NIC, the IC dock and the SSDs, things get closer to around the 350 range or so. Now, obviously this isn't like a buying guide for how to go get this stuff. And a lot of this was stuff I already had. So don't expect to build this exact same system and you really shouldn't build this exact same system, but hopefully this can kind of give an idea of what you might be able to piece together with deals that you can find if you're interested in building something similar. Now, if you are looking to go this route, I do have a couple recommendations. First, make sure to get plenty of memory. If you're buying something like this to run a bunch of virtual machines, you'll want a lot of memory for that. And I kind of made a mistake by buying the memory that I did. I could have actually bought 64 gigabytes of registered ECC memory for the same amount of money that I spent on the 32 gigabyte kit that I got. And it really doesn't matter that it's ECC, but registered ECC is sort of being dumped like crazy from any businesses that are still running it. So you can get it for really cheap. I would also recommend just not really going with the X79 platform at all, because you can go for X99, which is becoming a lot cheaper. You can find Haswell and even Broadwell chips for basically the same price as anything Sandy or Ivy Bridge. Now, those systems will use DDR4, which might make it a little bit more expensive to buy memory, but they're going to be way more efficient and have more modern creature comforts. I had a lot of fun making this video, and it was really interesting to check out a 10 year old CPU that once would have cost over $2,000. And I also had a lot of fun putting it in a case that brought back a lot of good memories. Hopefully you guys had a good time, and if you did, make sure to hit the like button, the subscribe button, and maybe even consider supporting me as a raid member on Patreon or as a YouTube member. I'm really thankful for what I get to do and that I get to make videos like these, so I'm really appreciative for all your support, whether it's through Patreon, YouTube membership, or just by watching these videos. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Jellyfin Grant. Jellyfin, Jellyfin ran great and could even transcode.